470, chapters 112 and 113 of The Count of Monte Cristo. Book talk begins at 1216. Welcome to Craftlit. The podcast for crafters who love books. My name is Heather Ordover, and I'm podcasting from where the Delaware River meets the Old York Road, New Hope, Pennsylvania. Episode 470. Counting. This episode of Craftlet is brought to you by its listeners. Many thanks and much gratefulness to all of the listeners who have gone over to patreon.com slash craftlet and pledge their support to the show. We couldn't do it without you. Thank you. Well, hello. I hope you are well. Everything is starting to cool down here, which we are very grateful for. And we are even more grateful knowing that that is not what's happening everywhere right now. So wherever you are, I hope you are safe now and as comfortable as you can be. And we'll have more on that in a moment. But first, I have been promising for a while to share some Scotland information for you. And I'm going to do pretty much what I did last time with Paris, which is to go in order through the itinerary that Diane has set out for us. That way, if you are finding yourself interested in going on a trip that includes places like this, you can get a hold of Diane at 1-800-826-2266 and find out more. Remember, all it takes is a $200 deposit to put down and save your space, which is a very good idea as Scotland trips tend to fill up. And that saves your seat for you. And that payment is refundable. If something goes wrong and you find that you can't go, you'll be able to get that back up until a deadline that Diane will be able to tell you about because I have forgotten it. It's been a while since I've been talking about Scotland. So here we go. The first thing we do is we fly into Glasgow. And this is very exciting to me because part of my family came from Glasgow. So I'm looking forward to that. One of the places that we get to go, though, when we first start touring on the tour is Paisley. Now, Paisley, if you've been listening for a little while, Paisley is going to be kind of interesting because we went on the 2015 tour to York and the Lake District. We went to Elizabeth Gaskell's house in Manchester, England. And one of the first things we saw when we walked into the parlor room was a display of Paisley shawls, the same kinds of shawl that our heroine is trying on in the very first scenes of North and South by Elizabeth Gaskell. So it turns out Paisley is the name that was given to a Kashmiri pattern. So all of these shawls, these lightweight cotton shawls, these very, very delicately printed and lightweight cotton shawls, they were originally made in Kashmir and I think one or two other places in India, and then they were exported. And then the people in Paisley started figuring out how to do it themselves. And clearly, Paisley was doing such a good job at replicating this Kashmiri pattern that we started calling the pattern Paisley. Uh Uh-huh. The place was called Paisley first, then that name was given to that pattern later. Now, it's a very old town. Paisley's been there for a really long time, like going back to Roman time, at least. And according to their website, they are the largest town in Scotland. I don't know if they're differentiating between town and city or if Paisley's just that massive, but we'll find out because we're going to be there. The Paisley Museum is really neat, and I'm absolutely recommending that you go to craftlit.com slash 470, 470, and follow the link to the paisley.org.uk site for this reason. If you are feeling the need to go down a rabbit hole and just spend some time looking at something that isn't dangerous or crazy or modern or shrieky, this is the site for you. And here's why. If you scroll down to uh, the bottom of the second photo on their homepage, which is the Cross and Town Hall of Paisley, which is really big. You can tell from this picture that looks like it was taken sometime around 
1900, maybe? Oh no, probably 1914-ish. They say at the bottom that the sections accessed through the buttons on the right, and what they mean by buttons is a list of links going down the right-hand side of the page. Those links detail everything you could possibly want to know about Paisley, about weaving, about history, about the history of the people who were in Paisley, about the history of people who were near Paisley, about mills and monks and radicals and abbeys and books and grammar schools and an ice rink and Paisley in a panic. All of these things are detailed out. So it's a, it's a historical data site as well as just, you know, information about the Paisley Museum. There's a, a photo history that would let you look at the town then and the town now, while the rich history option gives you information on when cars had never been heard of before and what Paisley looked like then. There's so much information. It's insane. It's just incredible. I love this. So that's just the general Paisley history site. Then when you go following the link to the Paisley Museum, You'll find that all those links on the right-hand side have been truncated and uh, whittled down to just the ones that have to do with the museum itself. Beautiful building. The shawl galleries were added in 1974, so those are relatively new, comparatively speaking, since the first municipal museum, the Paisley Museum, first municipal museum in Scotland, was opened in 1871. So it took them almost 100 years to get the shawls there but that's okay too. Also, it might interest you that Peter Coates, that you might know that name from J.P. Coates, the people who make thread, he was one of the original donors. So that together with the Paisley Philosophical Society, which has been there since 1808, made this whole museum possible back in 1871, which is pretty cool. It also houses art galleries, art and sculpture galleries, as well as a really nice library that you can look at as well. So we get to go to the Paisley Museum. Very cool. We also get to go to the Weaver's Cottage. The cottage is in Kilbarken, which is about 12 miles away from Glasgow, and it looks lovely. It looks a little bit like part of Beatrix Potter's cottage area, and they have, as you would expect, for some place called the Weaver's Cottage, a whole lot of information on how weaving was done historically. They have some nice, very old looms. They also have madder and woad growing in their gardens. So if you wanted to see how that kind of fabric dyeing works, here's an opportunity. Because they demonstrate and or explain, depending on what time of year you're there. And... uh it also looks really, really neat. So lots of nifty stuff. And I will have more Scotland information for you in our next episode. But first, before we get to our book talk, there is something going on that I'm sure you've heard about that is quite serious. And that is the effects of the most recent recent set of hurricanes, especially in regards to Puerto Rico. There are things that are happening. FEMA is at work. Uh, You can actually go to the FEMA website and check out to see what they've actually been doing. But in the meantime, part of the problem is airports have been damaged. Ports have been damaged. So getting things in is difficult. And when you factor in the cost of trying to help people recover from the hit that Houston took, the hit that Florida took, and now the hit that Puerto Rico has taken, that's an awful lot of work that needs to be done quickly. Puerto Rico being an island, that makes it even more difficult. And as you can imagine, it's pretty scary for the people who live there. I happen to have two friends here in New Hope, friends through the school system. And for a week, we weren't able to get word as to whether Renee's mother was okay or not. Renee's wife, Lourdes, she got a hold of her family relatively quickly. I mean, it was four days, which is terrifying, but, but we had, we had word that they're, they were okay. We finally got word Renee's mom's okay. That's great. However, I went to the two of them and said, okay, I want to do something. I have lots of students who are Puerto Rican or whose parents were born in Puerto Rico. 
I have lots of friends who are Puerto Rican or have relatives in Puerto Rico. I would like to do something with Craftlet. And I want to make sure that whatever it is that we're doing, the money's going to the right place and the right people are getting helped. So this episode goes live at three o'clock on Friday, September 29th. From that time, three o'clock Eastern through 11.59 p.m. Sunday night, October 1st, Eastern time. I will give half of any proceeds that come in from my online shop and any new subscriptions that come in. Half of that money will go to United for Puerto Rico. This is the, the website that's being hosted by the government of Puerto Rico that Rene and Lourdes said was the, the most trustworthy site, the most likely to get what is needed to the people who need it the most quickly. So if you want to download a digital copy of one of the premium audiobooks that you didn't get a chance to listen to, you can do that and half the money goes to Puerto Rico. If you want to tell friends about places where they can get downloadable annotated audiobooks, I will have links for you and you can give them to them and half of that money will go to Puerto Rico. I can track new subscriptions on Patreon and on the craftlit.com slash membership pages. Those are the ones where I can see the dates of when people signed up on my own, where I can look. If you sign up for the app, when you go through the sign up process, just take a, a screenshot or save the page, page as a PDF if you're on a browser so that you can send that to me, heather at craftlit.com, and I'll be able to see the date and I will send half of that sign up to Puerto Rico as well. Just hit a little close to a lot of people who I care about. So I thought, all right, let's do this thing. So to find out more, go to craftlit.com slash help and information, everything I just told you, plus links will be available there for you. And thank you. All right, book talk. There isn't a whole lot, again, not surprisingly, except Charles Perrault. You may have forgotten P-E-R-R-A-U-L-T. Charles Perrault was born in 1628, and he is responsible for all of the Into the Woods fairy tales, all of the ones that you probably thought were written down by the Brothers Grimm. No, that was Perrault. He was a lawyer first, and then he started writing. But one of the things that he did in his stories is he had often wicked little fairies who showed up unbidden at a wedding or at a baptism. Uh, you may remember the Sleeping Beauty story. You know, everything's about to be all hunky-dory and happy-happy when the little baby is born, and then the evil fairy shows up and says, oh no, not so fast. Nobody gets to have fun if I'm not having fun. And that's, that's the reference you're going to hear fly by at the beginning of today's chapters. Aside from that, there's not that much. Today is an episode of histories. We are, we are going to watch our count in some ways relive chunks of his history. And the reasons why are what we will discuss after you listen. All right, here we go. We've got two chapters. They are not short. They are chapter 112, The Departure, and 113, The Past. How appropriate. All right, here we go. Count of Monte Cristo by Alexandre Dumas. Chapter 112. The Departure. The recent event formed the theme of conversation throughout all Paris. Emmanuel and his wife conversed with natural astonishment in their little apartment in the Rue Melee upon the three successive, sudden, and most unexpected catastrophes of Morcerf, Donglars, and Villefort. Maximilien, who was paying them a visit, listened to their conversation, or rather was present at it plunged in his accustomed state of apathy. Indeed, said Julie, might we not almost fancy, Emmanuel, that those people so rich, so happy, but yesterday had forgotten in their prosperity that an evil genius, like the wicked fairies in Perrault's stories, who present themselves unbidden at a wedding or a baptism, hovered over them, and appeared all at once to revenge himself for their fatal neglect. 
"'What a dire misfortune!' said Emmanuel, thinking of Morcerf and Danglars. "'What dreadful sufferings!' said Julie, remembering Valentine, but whom, with a delicacy natural to women, she did not name before her brother. "'If the Supreme Being has directed the fatal blow,' said Emmanuel, "'it must be that he in his great goodness has perceived nothing in the past lives of those people to merit mitigation of their awful punishment.' "'Do you not form a very rash judgment, Emmanuel? said Julie, "'when my father, with a pistol in his hand, was once on the point of committing suicide, had any one then said, "'This man deserves his misery, would not that person have been deceived?' "'Yes, but your father was not allowed to fall. A being was commissioned to arrest the fatal hand of death about to descend on him.' Emmanuel had scarcely uttered these words when the sound of the bell was heard, the well-known signal given by the porter that a visitor had arrived. Nearly at the same instant the door was opened, and the Count of Monte Cristo appeared on the threshold. The young people uttered a cry of joy, while Maximilian raised his head, but let it fall again immediately. "'Maximilian!' said the Count, without appearing to notice the different impressions which his presence produced on the little circle." I come to seek you. To seek me? repeated Morel, as if awakening from a dream. Yes, said Monte Cristo. Has it not been agreed that I should take you with me? And did I not tell you yesterday to prepare for departure? I am ready, said Maximilian. I came expressly to wish them farewell. Whither are you going, Count? asked Julie. "'In the first instance, to Marseille, madame.' "'To Marseille?' exclaimed the young couple. "'Yes, and I take your brother with me.' "'Oh, Count,' said Julie, "'will you restore him to us, cured of his melancholy?' Morel turned away to conceal the confusion of his countenance. "'You perceive, then, that he is not happy,' said the Count. "'Yes,' replied the young woman, and fear much that he finds our home but a dull one i will undertake to divert him replied the count i am ready to accompany you sir said maximilian adieu my kind friends emmanuel julie farewell how oh, farewell exclaimed julie do you leave us thus so suddenly without any preparations for your journey without even a passport "'Needless delays, but increase the grief of parting,' said Monte Cristo. "'And Maximilian has doubtless proved himself with everything requisite. "'At least I advised him to do so.' "'I have a passport, and my clothes are ready packed,' said Morel, "'in his tranquil but mournful manner. "'Good,' said Monte Cristo, smiling. "'In these prompt arrangements we recognize the order of a well-disciplined soldier.' "'And you leave us?' said Julie. At a moment's warning? You do not give us a day? No, not even an hour before your departure. My carriage is at the door, madame, and I must be in Rome in five days. But does Maximilian go to Rome? exclaimed Manuel. I am going wherever it may please the Count to take me, said Morel, with a smile full of grief. I am under his orders for the next month. "'Oh, heavens! How strangely he expresses himself!' said Julie. "'Maximilian goes with me,' said the Count, in his kindest and most persuasive manner. "'Therefore, do not make yourself uneasy on your brother's account.' "'Once more farewell, my dear sister. Emmanuel, adieu,' Morel repeated. "'His carelessness and indifference touch me to the heart,' said Julie. "'Oh, Maximilian! Maximilian, you are certainly concealing something from us.' "'Pah!' said Monte Cristo. "'You will see him return to you gay, smiling, and joyful.' Maximilian cast a look of disdain, almost of anger, on the Count. "'We must leave you,' said Monte Cristo. "'Before you quit us, Count,' said Julie, "'will you permit us to express to you all that the other day—' "'Madame!' interrupted the count taking her two hands in his 
all that you could say in words would never express what i read in your eyes the thoughts of your heart are fully understood by mine like benefactors in romances i should have left you without seeing you again but that would have been a virtue beyond my strength because i am a weak and vain man fond of the tender kind and thankful glances of my fellow creatures on the eve of departure i carry my egotism so far as to say do not forget me my kind friends for probably you will never see me again never see you again exclaimed emmanuel while two large tears rolled down julie's cheeks never behold you again it is not a man then but some angel that leaves us and this angel is on the point of returning to heaven after having appeared on earth to do good say not so quickly returned monte cristo say not so my friends angels never err celestial beings remain where they wish to be fate is not more powerful than they it is they who on the contrary overcome fate no emmanuel i am but a man and your admiration is as unmerited as your words are sacrilegious and pressing his lips on the hand of julie who rushed into his arms he extended his other hand to emmanuel then tearing himself from this abode of peace and happiness he made a sign to maximilian who followed him passively with the indifference which had been perceptible in him ever since the death of valentine had so stunned him restore my brother to peace and happiness whispered julie to monte cristo and the count pressed her hand in reply as he had done eleven years before on the staircase leading to morel's study you still confide then in sinbad the sailor asked he smiling oh yes was the ready answer well then sleep in peace and put your trust in heaven as we have said before the post chaise was waiting four powerful horses were already pawing the ground with impatience while ali apparently just arrived from a long walk was standing at the foot of the steps his face bathed in perspiration well asked the count in arabic have you been to see the old man ali made a sign in the affirmative and have you placed the letter before him as i ordered you to do the slave respectfully signalized that he had and what did he say or rather do ali placed himself in the light so that his master might see him distinctly and then imitating in his intelligent manner the countenance of the old man he closed his eyes as noirtier was in the custom of doing when saying yes good he accepts said monte cristo now let us go these words had scarcely escaped him when the carriage was on its way and the feet of the horses struck a shower of sparks from the pavement maximilian settled himself in his corner without uttering a word half an hour had passed when the carriage stopped suddenly the count had just pulled the silken check string which was fastened to ali's finger the nubian immediately descended and opened the carriage door it was a lovely starlight night they had just reached the top of the hill villejuif from whence paris appears like a sombre sea tossing its millions of phosphoric waves into light waves indeed more noisy more passionate more changeable more furious more greedy than those of the tempestuous ocean waves which never rest as those of the sea sometimes do waves ever dashing ever foaming ever engulfing what falls within their grasp the count stood alone and at a sign from his hand the carriage went on for a short distance with folded arms he gazed for some time upon the great city when he had fixed his piercing look on this modern babylon which equally engages the contemplation of the religious enthusiast the materialist and the scoffer great city murmured he inclining his head and joining his hands as if in prayer less than six months have elapsed since first i entered the gates i believe that the spirit of god led my steps to thee and that he also enables me to quit thee in triumph 
the secret cause of my presence within thy walls i have confided alone to him who only has had the power to read my heart god only knows that i retire from thee without pride or hatred but not without many regrets he only knows that the power confided to me has never been made subservient to my personal good or to any useless cause o oh, great city it is in thy palpitating bosom that i have found that which i sought like a patient miner i have dug deep into thy very entrails to root out evil thence now my work is accomplished my mission is terminated now thou canst neither afford me pain nor pleasure adieu paris adieu his look wandered over the vast plain like that of some genius of the night he passed his hand over his brow got into the carriage the door was closed on him and the vehicle quickly disappeared down the other side of the hill in a whirlwind of noise and dust ten leagues were passed and not a single word was uttered morel was dreaming and monte cristo was looking at the dreamer morel said the count to him at length do you repent having followed me no count but to leave paris if i thought happiness might await you in paris morel i would have left you there valentine reposes within the walls of paris and to leave paris is like losing her a second time maximilian said the count the friends that we have lost do not repose in the bosom of the earth but are buried deep in our hearts and it has been thus ordained that we may always be accompanied by them i have two friends who in this way never depart from me the one who gave me being and the one who conferred knowledge and intelligence on me their spirits live in me i consult them when doubtful and if ever do any good it is due to their beneficent counsels listen to the voice of your heart morel and ask it whether you ought to preserve this melancholy exterior towards me my friend said maximilian the voice of my heart is very sorrowful and promises me nothing but misfortune it is the way of weakened minds to see everything through a black cloud the soul forms its own horizons your soul is darkened and consequently the sky of the future appears stormy and unpromising that may possibly be true said maximilian and he again subsided into his thoughtful mood the journey was performed with that marvellous rapidity which the unlimited power of the count ever commanded towns fled from them like shadows on their path and trees shaken by the first winds of autumn seemed like giants madly rushing on to meet them and retreating as rapidly when once reached the following morning they arrived at chalon where the count's steamboat waited for them without the loss of an instant the carriage was placed on board and the two travelers embarked without delay the boat was built for speed her two paddle wheels were like two wings with which she skimmed the water like a bird morel was not insensible to that sensation of delight which is generally experienced in passing rapidly through the air and the wind which occasionally raised the hair from his forehead seemed on the point of dispelling momentarily the clouds collected there as the distance increased between the travellers and paris almost superhuman serenity appeared to surround the count he might have been taken for an exile about to revisit his native land ere long marseilles presented herself to view marseilles white fervid full of life and energy marseilles the younger sister of tyre and carthage the successor of them in the empire of the mediterranean marseilles old yet always young powerful memories were stirred within them by the sight of the round tower fort saint nicolas the city hall designed by puget the port with its brick keys where they had both played in childhood and it was with one accord that they stopped on the canabiere 
a vessel was setting sail for algiers on board of which the bustle usually attending departure prevailed the passengers and their relations crowded on the deck friends taking a tender but sorrowful leave of each other some weeping others noisy in their grief the whole forming a spectacle that might be exciting even to those who witnessed similar sights daily but which had no power to disturb the current of thought that had taken possession of the mind of maximilian from the moment he had set foot on the broad pavement of the quay here said he leaning heavily on the arm of monte cristo here is the spot where my father stopped when the pharaoh entered the port it was here that the good old man whom you save from death and dishonor threw himself into my arms i yet feel his warm tears on my face and his were not the only tears shed for many who witnessed our meeting wept also monte cristo gently smiled and said i was there at the same time pointing to the corner of a street as he spoke and in the very direction he indicated a groan expressive of bitter grief was heard and a woman was seen waving her hand to a passenger on board the vessel about to sail monte cristo looked at her with an emotion that must have been remarked by morel had not his eyes been fixed on the vessel oh heavens exclaimed morel i do not deceive myself that young man who is waving his hat that youth in the uniform of a lieutenant is albert de morcerf yes said monte cristo i recognized him how so you were looking the other way the count smiled as he was in the habit of doing when he did not want to make any reply and he again turned towards the veiled woman who soon disappeared at the corner of the street turning to his friend dear maximilian said the count have you nothing to do in this land i have to weep over the grave of my father replied morel in a broken voice well then go wait for me there and i will soon join you you leave me then yes i also have a pious visit to pay morel allowed his hand to fall into that which the count extended to him then with an inexpressibly sorrowful inclination of the head he quitted the count and bent his steps to the east of the city monte cristo remained on the same spot until maximilian was out of sight he then walked slowly towards the allee de meillon to seek out a small house with which our readers were made familiar at the beginning of this story it yet stood under the shade of the fine avenue of lime trees which forms one of the most frequent walks of the idlers of marseilles covered by an immense vine which spreads its aged and blackened branches over the stone front burnt yellow by the ardent sun of the south two stone steps worn away by the friction of many feet led to the door which was made of three planks the door had never been painted or varnished so great cracks yawned in it during the dry season to close again when the rains came on the house with all its crumbling antiquity and apparent misery was yet cheerful and picturesque and was the same that old dante formerly inhabited the only difference being that the old man occupied merely the garret while the whole house was now placed at the command of mercedes by the count the woman whom the count had seen leave the ship with so much regret entered this house she had scarcely closed the door after her when monte cristo appeared at the corner of a street so that he found and lost her again almost at the same instant the worn-out steps were old acquaintances of his he knew better than any one else how to open that weather-beaten door with a large headed nail which served to raise the latch within he entered without knocking or giving any other intimation of his presence as if he had been a friend or the master of the place at the end of a passage paved with bricks was a little garden bathed in sunshine and rich in warmth and light in this garden mercedes had found at the place indicated by the count the sum of money which he through a sense of delicacy had described as having been placed there twenty-four years previously 
the trees of the garden were easily seen from the steps of the street door monte cristo on stepping into the house heard a sigh that was almost a deep sob he looked in the direction whence it came and there under an arbor of virginia jessamine with its thick foliage and beautiful long purple flowers he saw mercedes seated with her head bowed and weeping bitterly she had raised her veil and with her face hidden by her hands was giving free scope to the sighs and tears which had been so long restrained by the presence of her son monte cristo advanced a few steps which were heard on the gravel mercedes raised her head and uttered a cry of terror on beholding a man before her madame said the count it is no longer in my power to restore you to happiness but i offer you consolation will you deign to accept it as coming from a friend i am indeed most wretched replied mercedes alone in the world i had but my son and he has left me he possesses a noble heart madame replied the count and he has acted rightly he feels that every man owes a tribute to his country some contribute their talents others their industry these devote their blood those their nightly labors to the same cause had he remained with you his life must have become a hateful burden nor would he have participated in your griefs he will increase in strength and honor by struggling with adversity which he will convert into prosperity leave him to build up the future for you and i venture to say you will confide it to safe hands oh replied the wretched woman mournfully shaking her head the prosperity of which you speak and which from the bottom of my heart i pray god in his mercy to grant him i can never enjoy the bitter cup of adversity has been drained to me to the very dregs and i feel that the grave is not far distant you have acted kindly count in bringing me back to the place where i have enjoyed so much bliss i ought to meet death on the same spot where happiness was once all my own alas said monte cristo your words sear and embitter my heart the more so as you have every reason to hate me i have been the cause of all your misfortunes but why do you pity instead of blaming me you render me still more unhappy hate you blame you you edmond hate reproach the man that has spared my son's life for was it not your fatal and sanguinary intention to destroy that son of whom monsieur de morcerf was so proud oh look at me closely and discover if you can even the semblance of a reproach in me the count looked up and fixed his eyes on mercedes who arose partly from her seat and extended both her hands towards him oh look at me continued she with a feeling of profound melancholy my eyes no longer dazzled by their brilliancy for the time has long fled since i used to smile on edmond dante who anxiously looked out for me from the window of yonder garret then inhabited by his old father years of grief have created an abyss between those days and the present i neither reproach you nor hate you my friend oh no edmond it is myself that i blame myself that i hate oh miserable creature that i am cried she clasping her hands and raising her eyes to heaven i once possessed piety innocence and love the three ingredients of the happiness of angels and now what am i monte cristo approached her and silently took her hand no said she withdrawing it gently no my friend touch me not you have spared me yet of all those who have fallen under your vengeance i was the most guilty they were influenced by hatred by avarice and by self-love but i was base 
and for want of courage acted against my judgment. Nay, do not press my hand, Edmond. You are thinking, I am sure, of some kind speech to console me, but do not utter it to me. Reserve it for others more worthy of your kindness. See? And she exposed her face completely to view. See, misfortune has silvered my hair. My eyes have shed so many tears that they are encircled by a rim of purple, and my brow is wrinkled. You, Edmund, on the contrary, you are still young, handsome, dignified. It is because you have had faith, because you have had strength, because you have had trust in God, and God has sustained you. But as for me, I have been a coward. I have denied God, and he has abandoned me. Mercedes burst into tears. Her woman's heart was breaking under its load of memories. Monte Cristo took her hand and imprinted a kiss on it. But she herself felt that it was a kiss of no greater warmth than he would have bestowed on the hand of some marble statue of a saint. "'It often happens,' continued she, "'that a first fault destroys the prospects of a whole life. "'I believed you dead. "'Why did I survive you? "'What good has it done for me to mourn for you eternally "'in the secret recesses of my heart? "'Only to make a woman of thirty-nine look like a woman of fifty. "'Why, having recognized you, and I the only one to do so, why was I able to save my son alone? Ought I not also to have rescued the man that I had accepted for a husband, guilty though he were? Yet I let him die. What do I say? O oh, merciful heavens! Was I not accessory to his death by my supine insensibility, by my contempt for him, not remembering or not willing to remember that it was for my sake he had become a traitor and a perjurer. In what am I benefited by accompanying my son so far, since I now abandon him and allow him to depart alone to the baneful climate of Africa? Oh, I have been base, cowardly, I tell you, I have abjured my affections, and like all renegades I am of evil omen to those who surround me. No, Mercedes, said Monte Cristo, no, you judge yourself with too much severity. You are a noble-minded woman, and it was your grief that disarmed me. Still I was but an agent, led on by an invisible and offended deity, who chose not to withhold the fatal blow that I was destined to hurl. I take that God to witness, at whose feet I have prostrated myself daily for the last ten years, that I would have sacrificed my life to you, and with my life the projects that were indissolubly linked with it. But, and I say it with some pride, Mercedes, God needed me, and I lived. Examine the past and the present, and endeavour to dive into futurity, and then say whether I am not a divine instrument, the most dreadful misfortunes, the most frightful sufferings, the abandonment of all those who loved me, the persecution of those who did not know me, formed the trials of my youth, when suddenly from captivity, solitude, misery, I was restored to light and liberty and became the possessor of a fortune so brilliant, so unbounded, so unheard of, that I must have been blind not to be conscious that God had endowed me with it to work out his own great designs. From that time I looked upon this fortune as something confided to me for an especial purpose. Not a thought was given to a life which you once, Mercedes, had the power to render blissful. Not one hour of a peaceful calm was mine, but I felt myself driven on like an exterminating angel, 
like adventurous captains about to embark on some enterprise full of danger i laid in my provisions i loaded my weapons i collected every means of attack and defence i inured my body to the most violent exercises my soul to the bitterest trials i taught my arm to slay my eyes to behold excruciating sufferings and my mouth to smile at the most horrid spectacles good-natured confiding and forgiving as i had been i became revengeful cunning and wicked or rather immovable as fate then i launched out into the path that was open to me i overcame every obstacle and reached the goal but woe to those who stood in my pathway enough said mercedes enough it won't believe me that she who alone recognized you has been the only one to comprehend you and had she crossed your path and you had crushed her like glass still edmond still she must have admired you like the gulf between me and the past there is an abyss between you edmond and the rest of mankind and i tell you freely that the comparison i draw between you and other men will ever be one of my greatest tortures no there is nothing in the world to resemble you in worth and goodness but we must say farewell edmond and let us part before i leave you mercedes have you no request to make said the count i desire but one thing in this world edmond the happiness of my son pray to the almighty to spare his life and i will take upon myself to promote his happiness thank you edmond but have you no request to make for yourself mercedes for myself i want nothing i live as it were between two graves one is that of edmond dante lost to me long since he had my love that word ill becomes my faded lip now but it is a memory dear to my heart and one that i would not lose for all that the world contains the other grave is that of the man who met his death from the hand of edmond dante i approve of the deed but i must pray for the dead your son shall be happy mercedes repeated the count then i shall enjoy as much happiness as this world can possibly confer but what are your intentions to say that i shall live here like the mercedes of other times gaining my bread by labor would not be true nor would you believe me i have no longer the strength to do anything but to spend my days in prayer however i shall have no occasion to work for the little sum of money buried by you and which i found in the place you mentioned will be sufficient to maintain me rumour will probably be busy respecting me my occupations my manner of living that will signify but little mercedes said the count i do not say it to blame you but you made an unnecessary sacrifice in relinquishing the whole of the fortune amassed by m de morcerf half of it at least by right belonged to you in virtue of your vigilance and economy i perceive what you are intending to propose to me but i cannot accept it edmond my son would not permit it nothing shall be done without the full approbation of albert de morcerf i will make myself acquainted with his intentions and will submit to them but if he be willing to accept my offers will you oppose them you well know edmond that i am no longer a reasoning creature i have no will unless it be the will never to decide i have been so overwhelmed by the many storms that have broken over my head that i am become passive in the hands of the almighty like a sparrow in the talons of an eagle i live 
because it is not ordained for me to die. If succor be sent to me, I will accept it. Ah, madame, said Monte Cristo, you should not talk thus. It is not so we should evince our resignation to the will of heaven. On the contrary, we are all free agents. Alas, exclaimed Mercedes, if it were so, if I possessed free will, but without the power to render that will efficacious, it would drive me to despair. Monte Cristo dropped his head and shrank from the vehemence of her grief. "'Will you not even say, "'You will see me again?' he asked. "'On the contrary, we shall meet again,' said Mercedes, pointing to heaven with solemnity. "'I tell you so, to prove to you that I still hope.' And after pressing her own trembling hand upon that of the Count, Mercedes rushed up the stairs and disappeared. Monte Cristo slowly left the house and turned towards the quay. But Mercedes did not witness his departure, although she was seated at the little window of the room which had been occupied by old Dante. Her eyes were straining to see the ship which was carrying her son over the vast sea, but still her voice involuntarily murmured softly, Edmond! 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 End of chapter 112 Chapter 113 The Past The Count departed with a sad heart from the house in which he had left Mercedes, probably never to behold her again. Since the death of little Edward, a great change had taken place in Monte Cristo. Having reached the summit of his vengeance by a long and tortuous path, he saw an abyss of doubt yawning before him. More than this, the conversation which had just taken place between Mercedes and himself had awakened so many recollections in his heart that he felt it necessary to combat with them. A man of the Count's temperament could not long indulge in that melancholy which can exist in common minds, but which destroys superior ones. He thought he must have made an error in his calculations if he now found cause to blame himself. "'I cannot have deceived myself,' he said. "'I must look upon the past in a false light. "'What?' he continued. "'Can I have been following a false path? "'Can the end which I proposed be a mistaken end? "'Can one hour have sufficed to prove to an architect "'that the work upon which he founded all his hopes "'was an impossible, if not a sacrilegious, undertaking? "'I cannot reconcile myself to this idea. "'It would madden me. The reason why I am now dissatisfied is that I have not a clear appreciation of the past. The past, like the country through which we walk, becomes indistinct as we advance. My position is like that of a person wounded in a dream. He feels the wound, though he cannot recollect when he received it. Come, then, thou regenerate man, thou extravagant prodigal, thou awakened sleeper, thou all-powerful visionary, thou invincible millionaire once again review thy past life of starvation and wretchedness revisit the scenes where fate and misfortune conducted and where despair received thee too many diamonds too much gold and splendour are now reflected by the mirror in which monte cristo seeks to behold dante hide thy diamonds bury thy gold shroud thy splendour exchange riches for poverty, liberty for a prison, a living body for a corpse. As he thus reasoned, Monte Cristo walked down the Rue de la Caisserie. It was the same through which twenty-four years ago he had been conducted by a silent and nocturnal guard. The houses, today so smiling and animated, were on that dark night mute and closed. And yet they were the same, murmured Monte Cristo, only now it is a broad daylight instead of night. It is the sun which brightens the place, and makes it appear so cheerful. He proceeded towards the quay by the Rue Saint-Laurent, and advanced to the Consigne. It was the point where he had embarked. 
a pleasure boat with striped awning was going by monte cristo called the owner who immediately rowed up to him with the eagerness of a boatman hoping for a good fare the weather was magnificent and the excursion a treat the sun red and flaming was sinking into the embrace of the welcoming ocean the sea smooth as crystal was now and then disturbed by the leaping of fish which were pursued by some unseen enemy and sought for safety in another element while on the extreme verge of the horizon might be seen the fishermen's boats white and graceful as the seagull or the merchant vessels bound for corsica or spain but notwithstanding the serene sky the gracefully formed boats and the golden light in which the whole scene was bathed the count of monte cristo wrapped in his cloak could think only of this terrible voyage the details of which were one by one recalled to his memory the solitary light burning at the catalans that first sight of the chateau d'if which told him whither they were leading him the struggle with the gendarme when he wished to throw himself overboard his despair when he found himself vanquished and the sensation when the muzzle of the carbine touched his forehead all these were brought before him in vivid and frightful reality like the streams which the heat of the summer has dried up and which after the autumnal storms gradually begin oozing drop by drop so did the count feel his heart gradually fill with the bitterness which formerly nearly overwhelmed edmond dante clear sky swift flitting boats and brilliant sunshine disappeared the heavens were hung with black and the gigantic structure of the chateau d'if seemed like the phantom of a mortal enemy as they reached the shore the count instinctively shrunk to the extreme end of the boat and the owner was obliged to call out in his sweetest tone of voice sir we are at the landing monte cristo remembered that on the very spot on the same rock he had been violently dragged by the guards who forced him to ascend the slope at the points of their bayonets the journey had seemed very long to dante but monte cristo found it equally short each stroke of the oar seemed to awaken a new throng of ideas which sprang up with the flying spray of the sea there had been no prisoners confined in the chateau d'if since the revolution of july it was only inhabited by a guard kept there for the prevention of smuggling a concierge waited at the door to exhibit to visitors this monument of curiosity once a scene of terror the count inquired whether any of the ancient jailers were still there but they had all been pensioned or had passed on to some other employment the concierge who attended him had only been there since 1830 he visited his own dungeon he again beheld the dull light vainly endeavoring to penetrate the narrow opening his eyes rested upon the spot where had stood his bed since then removed and behind the bed the new stones indicated where the breach made by the abbe faria had been monte cristo felt his limbs tremble he seated himself upon a log of wood are there any stories connected with this prison besides the one relating to the poisoning of mirabeau asked the count are there any traditions respecting these dismal abodes in which it is difficult to believe men can ever have imprisoned their fellow creatures yes sir indeed the jailer antoine told me one connected with this very dungeon monte cristo shuddered antoine had been his jailer he had almost forgotten his name and face but at the mention of the name he recalled his person as he used to see it the face encircled by a beard wearing the brown jacket the bunch of keys the jingling of which he still seemed to hear the count turned around and fancied he saw him in the corridor rendered still darker by the torch carried by the concierge would you like to hear the story sir yes relate it said monte cristo pressing his hand to his heart to still its violent beatings he felt afraid of hearing his own history this dungeon said the concierge was it appears some time ago occupied by a very dangerous prisoner the more so since he was full of industry another person was confined in the chateau at the same time but he was not wicked he was only a poor mad priest 
"'Ah, indeed. Mad?' repeated Monte Cristo. "'And what was his mania?' "'He offered millions to anyone who would set him at liberty.' Monte Cristo raised his eyes, but he could not see the heavens. There was a stone veil between him and the firmament. He thought that there had been no less thicker veil before the eyes of those to whom Faria offered the treasures. "'Could the prisoners see each other?' he asked. "'Oh, no, sir. It was expressly forbidden. But they eluded the vigilance of the guards, and made a passage from one dungeon to the other.' "'And which of them made this passage?' oh it must have been the young man certainly for he was strong and industrious while the abbe was aged and weak besides his mind was too vacillating to allow him to carry out an idea blind fools murmured the count however be that as it may the young man made a tunnel or how by what means no one knows but he made it and there is the evidence yet remaining of his work do you see it and the man held the torch to the wall. "'Ah, uh, yes, I see,' said the Count, his voice hoarse with emotion. "'The result was that the two men communicated with one another. How long they did so, nobody knows. One day the old man fell ill and died. Now guess what the young one did. Tell me. He carried off the corpse, which he placed in his own bed with its face to the wall, then he entered the empty dungeon closed the entrance and slipped into the sack which had contained the dead body did you ever hear of such an idea monte cristo closed his eyes and seemed again to experience all the sensations he had felt when the coarse canvas yet moist with the cold dews of death had touched his face the jailer continued now this was his project he fancied that they buried the dead at the chateau d'if and imagining they would not expend much labor on the grave of a prisoner, he calculated on raising the earth with his shoulders. But, unfortunately, their arrangements at the chateau frustrated his projects. They never buried the dead. They merely attached a heavy cannonball to the feet and then threw them into the sea. This is what was done. The young man was thrown from the top of the rock. The corpse was found on the bed the next day, and the whole truth was guessed, for the men who performed the office then mentioned what they had not dared to speak of before, that at the moment the corpse was thrown into the deep, they heard a shriek, which was almost immediately stifled by the water in which it disappeared. The Count breathed with difficulty, the cold drops ran down his forehead, and his heart was full of anguish. No, he muttered, the doubt I felt was but the commencement of forgetfulness. But here the wound reopens, and the heart again thirsts for vengeance. And the prisoner, he continued aloud, was he ever heard of afterwards? Oh, no, of course not. You can understand that one of two things must have happened. He must either have fallen flat, in which case the blow from a height of ninety feet must have killed him instantly, or he must have fallen upright, and then the weight would have dragged him to the bottom where he remained poor fellow then you pity him said the count ma foi yes though he was in his own element what do you mean the report was that he had been a naval officer who had been confined for plotting with the bonapartists great is the truth muttered the count fire cannot burn nor water drown it thus the poor sailor lives in the recollection of those who narrate his history his terrible story is recited in the chimney corner and a shudder is felt at the description of his transit through the air to be swallowed by the deep then the count added aloud was his name ever known oh yes but only as number thirty four oh villefort villefort murmured the count this scene must often have haunted thy sleepless hours do you wish to see anything more sir said the concierge yes especially if you will show me the poor abbe's room ah numero twenty seven yes number twenty seven repeated the count who seemed to hear the voice of the abbe 
answering him in those very words through the wall when asked his name come sir wait said monte cristo i wish to take one final glance around this room this is fortunate said the guide i have forgotten the other key go and fetch it i will leave you the torch sir no take it away i can see in the dark why you are like numero thirty four they said he was so accustomed to darkness that he could see a pin in the darkest corner of his dungeon he spent fourteen years to arrive at that muttered the count the guide carried away the torch the count had spoken correctly scarcely had a few seconds elapsed ere he saw everything as distinctly as by daylight then he looked around him and really recognized his dungeon yes he said there is a stone upon which i used to sit there is the impression made by my shoulders on the wall there is the mark of my blood made when one day i dashed my head against the wall oh those figures how well i remember them i made them one day to calculate the age of my father that i might know whether i should find him still living and that of mercedes to know if i should find her still free after finishing that calculation i had a minute's hope i did not reckon upon hunger and infidelity and a bitter laugh escaped the count he saw in fancy the burial of his father and the marriage of mercedes on the other side of the dungeon he perceived an inscription the white letters of which were still visible on the green wall o oh god he read preserve my memory oh yes he cried that was my only prayer at last i no longer begged for liberty but memory i dreaded to become mad and forgetful o oh god thou hast preserved my memory i thank thee i thank thee at this moment the light of the torch was reflected on the wall the guide was coming monte cristo went to meet him follow me sir and without ascending the stairs the guide conducted him by a subterraneous passage to another entrance there again monte cristo was assailed by a multitude of thoughts the first thing that met his eye was the meridian drawn by the abbe on the wall by which he calculated the time then he saw the remains of the bed on which the poor prisoner had died the sight of this instead of exciting the anguish experienced by the count in the dungeon filled his heart with a soft and grateful sentiment and tears fell from his eyes this is where the mad abbe was kept sir and that is where the young man entered and the guide pointed to the opening which had remained unclosed from the appearance of the stone he continued a learned gentleman discovered that the prisoners might have communicated together for ten years poor things those must have been ten weary years dante took some louis from his pocket and gave them to the man who had twice unconsciously pitied him the guide took them thinking them merely a few pieces of little value but the light of the torch revealed their true worth sir he said you have made a mistake you have given me gold i know it the concierge looked upon the count with surprise sir he cried scarcely able to believe his good fortune sir i cannot understand your generosity oh it is very simple my good fellow i have been a sailor and your story touched me more than it would others then sir since you are so liberal i ought to offer you something what have you to offer me my friend shells straw work thank you no sir neither of those something connected with this story really what is it listen said the guide i said to myself something is always left in a cell inhabited by one prisoner for fifteen years so i began to sound the wall ah cried monte cristo remembering the abbe's two hiding places after some search i found that the floor gave a hollow sound near the head of the bed and at the hearth 
yes said the count yes i raised the stones and found a rope ladder and some tools how do you know that asked the guide in astonishment i do not know i only guess it because that sort of thing is generally found in prisoner cells yes sir a rope ladder and tools and have you them yet no sir i sold them to visitors who considered them great curiosities but i have still something left what is it asked the count impatiently a sort of book written upon strips of cloth go and fetch it my good fellow and if it be what i hope you will do well i will run for it sir and the guide went out then the count knelt down by the side of the bed which death had converted into an altar o oh, second father he exclaimed thou who hast given me liberty knowledge riches thou who like beings of a superior order to ourselves couldst understand the science of good and evil if in the depths of the tomb there still remains something within us which can respond to the voice of those who are left on earth if after death the soul ever revisit the places where we have lived and suffered then noble heart sublime soul then i conjure thee by the paternal love thou didst bear me by the filial obedience i vowed to thee grant me some sign some revelation remove from me the remains of doubt which if it change not to conviction must become remorse the count bowed his head and clasped his hands together here sir said a voice behind him monte cristo shuddered and arose the concierge held out the strips of cloth upon which the abbe faria had spread the riches of his mind the manuscript was the great work by the abbe faria upon the kingdoms of italy the count seized it hastily his eyes immediately fell upon the epigraph and he read thou shalt tear out the dragon's teeth and shalt trample the lions under foot saith the lord ah he exclaimed here is my answer thanks father thanks and feeling in his pocket he took thence a small pocket-book which contained ten banknotes each of one thousand francs here he said take this pocket-book do you give it to me yes but only on one condition that you will not open it till i am gone and placing in his breast the treasure he had just found which was more valuable to him than the richest jewel he rushed out of the corridor and reaching his boat cried to marseilles then as he departed he fixed his eyes upon the gloomy prison woe he cried to those who confined me in that wretched prison and woe to those who forgot that i was there as he repassed the catalans the count turned around and burying his head in his cloak murmured the name of a woman the victory was complete twice he had overcome his doubts the name he pronounced in a voice of tenderness amounting almost to love was that of haiti on landing the count turned towards the cemetery where he felt sure of finding morel he too ten years ago had piously sought out a tomb and sought it vainly he who returned to france with millions had been unable to find the grave of his father who had perished from hunger morel had indeed placed a cross over the spot but it had fallen down and the gravedigger had burnt it as he did all the old wood in the churchyard the worthy merchant had been more fortunate dying in the arms of his children he had been by them laid by the side of his wife who had preceded him in eternity by two years two large slabs of marble on which were inscribed their names were placed on either side of a little enclosure railed in and shaded by four cypress trees morel was leaning against one of these mechanically fixing his eyes on the graves his grief was so profound that he was nearly unconscious maximilian said the count you should not look on the graves but there and he pointed upwards the dead are everywhere said morel 
did you not yourself tell me so as we left paris maximilian said the count you asked me during the journey to allow you to remain some days at marseilles do you still wish to do so i have no wishes count only i fancy i could pass the time less painfully here than anywhere else so much the better for i must leave you but i carry your word with me do i not ah count i shall forget it no you will not forget it because you are a man of honour morel because you have taken an oath and are about to do so again oh count have pity upon me i am so unhappy i have known a man much more unfortunate than you morel impossible alas said monte cristo it is the infirmity of our nature always to believe ourselves much more unhappy than those who groan by our sides what can be more wretched than the man who has lost all he loved and desired in the world listen morel and pay attention to what i am about to tell you i knew a man who like you had fixed all his hopes of happiness upon a woman he was young he had an old father whom he loved a betrothed bride whom he adored he was about to marry her when one of the caprices of fate which would almost make us doubt the goodness of providence if that providence did not afterwards reveal itself by proving that all is but a means of conducting to an end one of those caprices deprived him of his mistress of the future of which he had dreamed for in his blindness he forgot he could only read the present and cast him into a dungeon ah said morel one quits a dungeon in a week a month or a year he remained there fourteen years morel said the count placing his hand on the young man's shoulder maximilian shuddered fourteen years he muttered fourteen years repeated the count during that time he had many moments of despair he also morel like you considered himself the unhappiest of men well asked morel well at the height of his despair god assisted him through human means at first perhaps he did not recognize the infinite mercy of the lord but at last he took patience and waited one day he miraculously left the prison transformed rich powerful his first cry was for his father but that father was dead my father too is dead said morel yes but your father died in your arms happy respected rich and full of years his father died poor despairing almost doubtful of providence and when his son sought his grave ten years afterwards his tomb had disappeared and no one could say there sleeps the father you loved so well oh exclaimed morel he was then a more unhappy son than you morel for he could not even find his father's grave but then he had the woman he loved still remaining you are deceived morel that woman she was dead worse than that she was faithless and had married one of the persecutors of her betrothed you see then morel that he was a more unhappy lover than you and as he found consolation he has at last found peace and does he ever expect to be happy he hopes so maximilian the young man's head fell on his breast you have my promise he said after a minute's pause extending his hand to monte cristo only remember on the fifth of october morel i shall expect you at the island of monte cristo on the fourth a yacht will wait for you in the port of bastia it will be called the euros you will give your name to the captain who will bring you to me it is understood is it not but count do you remember that the fifth of october 
child replied the count not to know the value of a man's word i have told you twenty times that if you wish to die on that day i will assist you morel farewell do you leave me yes i have business in italy i leave you alone with your misfortunes and with hope maximilian when do you leave immediately the steamer waits and in an hour i shall be far from you will you accompany me to the harbour maximilian i am entirely yours count morel accompanied the count to the harbour the white steam was ascending like a plume of feathers from the black chimney the steamer soon disappeared and in an hour afterwards as the count had said was scarcely distinguishable in the horizon amidst the fogs of the night end of chapter 113 all right wow so first off did your head spin around on your neck when you heard that it's been less than six months total since <laughs> since the count showed up in paris wow he works fast that was extraordinary and a little and a little kind of pushback happening in me with his oh god what hath i done <laughs> were it not for thou help i had a little trouble with that i thought it was kind of over the top but i also i guess i can see where dumas was going with this because we've just watched a horrible horrible thing happen but dumas had to finish the book <laughs> he had to finish the book he kind of written himself into a position where logically the count might take a step back and say wow maybe i shouldn't do that anymore but then he had to remember so the scene with mercedes was so sad and beautiful and sad and Albert, little Albert is going off to be a, a grown-up. He's going to do the right thing. And he's such a good boy. And it's impossible not to love Albert, I think. And then he goes to the Chateau d'If. I love this chapter. I don't know about you. I loved this chapter. But the thing that hit me hardest, I wasn't expecting. The thing that hit me hardest was the importance to Dantes, the importance of being remembered. Yeah, okay, they didn't get his name. I mean, they remembered him as number 34. It's very similar to Dumas' friend and what he did in his book, Les Miserables, where you've got Jean Valjean 24601, and that's, that's the name he goes by for so long. That's the name that's kind of tattooed on the inside of his eyelids. And it's the same for Edmund, that maybe 34 is the name that he should be remembered by. But I thought it was so interesting that he, he decided to, to tip the man who showed him the cell, the concierge who showed him the cell, because the man felt pity for the prisoner. Pity was certainly something that was in short supply when Edmund was there. Nobody but the Abbe really had pity on him. I thought it was uh, amazingly written and incredibly touching. And just taking the time to go back, to take us back in time to the cell. It's been so long since we were in the cell. And remember, it would have been for Dumas readers too. As long as it's taken us to do this book, it's not all that much longer than it took Dumas readers to get all of the book too. So we all needed that little reminder of, if you think he's been over the top, remember what was taken from him and by proxy what was taken from the Abbe. And the one thing that I thought was kind of interesting was after learning that he was only remembered by the number 34, his line was, oh, via four, via four, this scene must often have haunted thy sleepless hours. And I thought, Really? I kind of wondered if Viafor didn't just, you know, forget conveniently. He didn't seem to me to be somebody who was overly haunted by memories of people who he had put out to punish. And I'm sure in his mind, he had rationalized a very good reason for why Edmond 
needed to be there outside of the fact that Viafor was just protecting his family name and job and title. But nonetheless, an interesting, an interesting chapter ending with the scene with Morel. So he's reminded Morel, Morel is not too off himself until a certain date and time. He's made it clear that he's probably not going to see Morel until around then, which has Morel a little nervous. Interesting. And where is the Count going? He's got to go do some business in Italy. And that is where we pick up next week. Don't forget to call in with your comments and thoughts on The Count of Monte Cristo, the book as a whole, and I will compile everybody's everything into an episode with Justin's help. And you'll get to hear what everybody else thought of the book too, which should be fun. Call 206-350-1642, and that'll send me an audio file of your commentary. Or you can go to speakpipe.com slash craftlet and chat with us there. All right, that's it for me for this week. You take care of yourself and I will talk to you soon. Have a great one. Talk to you later. Bye. A big thanks to all the Craftlet listeners who support the show by being a premium audio member via craftlit.com slash premium or via patreon.com slash craftlit. Your support for the show is what's kept us going since 2006. If you feel like getting free audio pretty much every week, please consider supporting the show by heading over to patreon.com slash craftlit and pledging what you feel the show is worth to you. If you can't support the show that way, consider leaving a review at iTunes or at our facebook.com slash craftlit page or follow at craftlit on Twitter and share the show with your followers too. And remember, if your hands are too busy to pick up a book, at least you can turn one on.